When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken Who I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love
Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of the cell? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. 
behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Welcome to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood.
for just squeezing us tight when we don't feel loved and we feel lost and we don't feel like we have a place we have that place with you Lord that your grace just covers us and fills us and draws us close to you thank you that we can come together today and just make that joyful noise to you take that moment to just rest in who you are Father, I lift up pastor to you, and I just ask that you fill him with your mercy and your love and your wisdom and your knowledge, and just speak to us through him, Lord. We thank you for about all the things that you are about to do, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. What's going on, church family? We're going to continue our study of Romans. The series is titled, Will All Israel Be Saved? And we're going to finish up Romans chapter 9 today. And we're going to tackle scripture today that has been very controversial through the years. And the reason it is is because there's a theology, a doctrine that has been based on what Paul is saying. And I just want to be up front with you that a lot of times we adhere to things that may not specifically be true, and we need to understand that we need to look at the full counsel of God. That's how we understand what's being written. As I shared with you when I started the study, that a lot of the notes that I'm using is from a lecture that I had with one of my professors, Dr. Nicholas Shazer, and he's one of the professors at the university in Israel that I study online with. Brilliant man. Um, and my, master, my master's degree is based on Jewish and biblical studies. My bachelor's degree was based on biblical studies. The difference is that I did my biblical studies uh, bachelor's degree here in the States. This one is with a school that's rooted in Judaism, but I'm studying with Jewish believers, and so it's an amazing richness to the scriptures that I'm getting. So you may or may not agree with me today, and that's okay. This is not anything to divide over. This is not an essential. But boy, do we ever divide over this topic that we're going to tackle this morning. Now, last week we saw Paul address the question of why most Jews were rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. 
And he explained that the promises and the covenants and the things that were, were given were given to Israel first. And that Christ himself came from the lineage of Israel as the Messiah. And Paul went on to state that Israel's rejection of Jesus is part of God's divine plan for the nation of Israel. And that things will play out in the end. And we're going to see this as we continue through Romans 9, 10, and 11. Now today Paul is going to continue his thought process on why most Jews have rejected Jesus as the Messiah... And we're going to come to some conclusions today that are going to help us understand better what Paul is writing in these passages of Scripture. So if you'd open up your Bibles and your tablets or whatever you're using this morning, I'm going to be starting in Romans chapter 9, verse 14. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV this morning. I just like the way it flows. Paul writes, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. So, Lord, help us to understand these passages of Scripture that we're going to uh, go through today. I pray, Lord, that we would have open hearts and minds. Holy Spirit, that you would instruct us and teach us. And, Father, that we would have a better understanding of what Romans is telling us here. So thank you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul asks a question. He says, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Is God unjust? Now, Paul is going to cite scripture from the book of Exodus regarding Pharaoh and how God used Pharaoh to show his power. Remember, even with Pharaoh, God was merciful. He was still merciful with Pharaoh. Pharaoh in Egypt were corrupt. They were were pagans. They treated the Israelites with contempt and without mercy. And yet, God, because he's a merciful God, he did not wipe the nation of of Egypt out. He could have. God could have said, you know what? I don't need to do any of this. I don't need to do the plagues. I don't don't need Moses. I can just wipe Egypt out and I can just set Israel out on their own. But God wanted to demonstrate who he was. He wanted to demonstrate his power, his love, and his mercy in all of this. Egypt could have very well been like Sodom and Gomorrah, wiped off the face of the earth. God didn't do that. Verse 19 says, One of you will say to me, Then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, Why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and for some common use? So now these these verses here that we just read, they're used primarily to support various versions of the predestination doctrine, which teaches that God has the destinies of all humanity and all creation planned out in advance. And all human beings are stuck to this plan, and there's nothing they can do to change it. Whatever it is, it is. But here's the thing. If we look closer at this passage of Scripture and saying it proves predestination doctrine is being taught here by Paul, it's problematic for a couple of reasons. Let me tell you. The first one is that Paul's pottery imagery does not point to predestination in the way that it's being taught. And second, shifting Paul's discourse here to the topic of predestination takes attention away from the real focus of this portion of Scripture, 
which is God's ongoing loyalty to Israel despite a current lack of faith in Jesus. Now, while Paul quotes loosely from Isaiah here, that's what these, these uh, verses are from, right? And he quotes loosely from Isaiah's picture of God forming humanity. There's other portions of Scripture that talk about pottery, the image of pottery. One of those is in Jeremiah chapter 18, which describes God as a potter whose decisions about the clay are contingent upon the human response to God's will. Now, you got to look at this, church. In so far as much as human action influences divine decrees in Jeremiah, Paul's own pottery language draws on Scripture that undermines the doctrine of predestination, and that's what we need to draw on this morning. We need to separate these things out. If you go to Jeremiah chapter 18, starting in verse 6, here's what it reads. He said, Can I do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. So what do we see in these scriptures? Well, God is clearly stating that although humanity is being shaped by his hands as the potter, the human response plays a part in divine will. It plays a part. If you, if you look at verse 8, it says, If that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I planned. Listen, you need to understand, that word relent is the same exact word in Hebrew as repent. It's the same word. It's a translation thing here. But it's the same word. In verse 8 when it says, And if that nation I warned repents, that word relent is the same word. It's the same word, repent. What is that saying, right? What is it saying? Well, what does it mean to repent? Repent means to change your heart or change direction. That's what repent means. You change. You go the opposite direction. To, to have sorrow or to, or to say, you know what? I need to turn away from that. So, so God is saying, look, man, here's, here's the deal. Right? I might pronounce destruction on you, but if you shape up, I'm, I'll change my mind on that. I won't go through it. Let, let me give you an example. Jonah. Okay? Jonah. Jonah's told to go to the nation of Nineveh and pronounce judgment on him. Now, Jonah doesn't want to go. He cannot stand the Ninevites because the Ninevites were really, really bad people. And they did not like the nation of Israel, and they loved to cause trouble. As you know, Jonah didn't want to go. He gets thrown in the, in the water. This big fish it gobbles him up. The big fish spits him up on the shore. Jonah has a change of heart, and he goes, and he, he speaks to the, the Ninevites and says, Hey, buck up, or God's going to destroy you. He's already proclaimed it. He's going he's to wipe you out. What happened? Much to Jonah's dismay, they heard the message, and God said, Well, Cool, I'm done. I'm not going to take you out. They got to stick around for another 100 years. God ended up taking them out, but they got to stick around for another 100 years. Here's what you need to understand. God can make a decision. And he, as God, can change his direction or his will as he chooses. He's God. He's God. Listen, God is so big and so I don't understand how God thinks. If, if I could, I don't need him. I don't need God. But we want to put God in this little box. This is how you operate, God. This is how you do things. 
because it, it makes sense to us as human beings. God, God can change direction at any time. And God is talking about the nation of Israel here in Jeremiah. And so is Paul in Romans. This is why Paul uses this pottery analogy because he's still talking about the nation of Israel. Paul is also. Listen, God makes certain choices, but human action can change the plan. It can change the plan. Remember Moses. God said, I am wiping these people out I'm disgusted with them. I'm sick of their murmuring and complaining. I am destroying them. He didn't say, I might destroy them. He says, I'm going to destroy them. I'm doing it now. What did Moses do? Fell on his face. He said, Lord, please don't do this because it's going to affect your great name. Because the nations are going to hear of what you did, destroying the very people that you chose, and it's going to make you look bad. That's basically what Moses is saying. You don't believe me? Read it for yourself. And God said, for your sake and for mine, I'm going to do it. God's intent was to, was to annihilate them. He says, check it out, Moses, I'm going to keep you around. You're the only one I'm keeping around. I'm going to build another nation out of you. But instead, God's heart was moved by what Moses said. See, listen, God is moved. Why do we pray? See, I used to be taught that we prayed so that I could align my will with God's. Well, yes, that's why we pray. But there's more reasons than that. Another reason is because God is moved by our prayers, man. He's a compassionate father. When my kids come to me, they're, they're grown now, but they still come to me and mom for stuff. And when they come and they're really in trouble or they're really in pain or they're really hurting, and I go, I'm not moved by your words. No, I'm moved by their words and I'm moved to action because of their words. And I dive in and I do what I can to help my kids out, man. God is the same way. That's why we pray. He is moved by your prayers. He's moved by them. Divine will and human action go hand in hand. And the game can change based on how an individual people or nation respond. So this pottery image that is being used for predestination is really talking about a mystery that is hard for us to understand. And here's, the, here's what it is. That a sovereign God who has all the universe in his hands still allows humans to have free will. Listen, we make choices every day. God did not tell me to wear the blue shirt today. I did. I said, what blue shirt did I wear last week? The striped one. So I want to wear this one today, right? Now, some people will go as far as to say, gee, that was the Holy Spirit moving on you. Okay, well, I still believe I chose the blue shirt. I think the Holy Spirit would have chose the other one. So, <laughs> But... <laughs> And there are those who teach that when it comes to salvation, you have no choice. That the choice was made for you, right? You had no choice coming to God, right? There are people that teach that doctrine. They teach that theology, right? Here's the problem with that. From the beginning of time, we see that a choice was given for man to make. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Now, God had created them perfectly. They were perfect in every sense. They were perfect. Yet God laid something out and said, do not do this. Do not partake of this tree. Don't do it. You can have everything else. Just not that. A choice was given for them to make. They could choose to obey God and have everything else. Or they can choose what they chose, which was, we're going after the tree. God gave them a choice. God didn't force them. He didn't say, you are going to stay perfect. He didn't say that. He gave them the choice. In Exodus and Deuteronomy, as we, as we read the, the Pentateuch, right, we, we see in those first five books many times where God tells the nation of Israel to choose. Choose what? 
Choose what you're going to do. Are you going to obey me or disobey me? Obey me, you're going to get blessed. Disobey me, there's going to be problems. The choice is made. When, ta- when Paul talks about predestination in, ph- in Ephesians, you need to understand what he's really saying there. Again, it's knowing the full counsel of God and reading it in the original text. The original text. Paul is talking about when we come into a relationship with Jesus, those who belong to Christ, you are predestined to be like him. See, when you come into a relationship with Jesus, God has already predestined it so that when you come into that relationship, you're going to be like Christ. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about this elite group. Whoop, you're chosen and you're not. Whoop, you, you, you're in, you're not. No. No. Jesus came for all. Mankind has a response. So Paul's discourse is not on predestination, but rather on God's salvation of Israel. And somewhat surprisingly, and now we're going to really dig into this, church, God's historical use of Gentiles as conduits of their rescue and salvation. This is what Paul, why he's using this passage of Scripture from the Old Testament. If you go to Isaiah chapter 45... God uses a Gentile king to bring Israel back from exile. That's what, that's what Paul is using in the broader sense here in Romans, right? And, and it's, it's in the broader sense that the Jews are going to come back to salvation, but they're going to come back through the Gentiles. Now, if you go to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 9, here's what it reads. What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Does the clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong? Does the pot exclaim, How clumsy can you be? How terrible it would be if a newborn baby said to its father, Why was I born? Or said to its mother, Why did you make me this way? This is what the Lord says, The Holy One of Israel and your creator. Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the works of my hands? So this is the passages of Scripture that Paul is thinking of as he's writing what he writes. Paul uses pottery image in Isaiah to set up what's going on with Israel and salvation in God's plan for Israel. What do you mean, right? What does this have to do with salvation? What, what, you're, you're tripping, pastor. What, I mean, this has nothing to do with salvation. Well, here's the thing. It has everything to do with it because, again, you have to read the full counsel of God. You can't just take this portion of Scripture and build a doctrine out of it. Because here's the thing. If you go up and begin to read chapter 45 from the very beginning, you're going to see exactly what God is talking about here. Verse 1 reads, this is what the Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed one, whose right hand he will empower. Before him, mighty kings will be paralyzed with fear. Their fortress gates will be open, never to shut again. This is what the Lord says. I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the mountains. I will smash down gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. And I will give you treasures hidden in the darkness, secret riches. I will do this so you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, the one who calls you by name. And why have I called you for this work? Why did I call you by name when you did not know me? It's for, my, it's for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. See, God was going to raise up a Gentile king by the name of Cyrus. And Cyrus was going to be instrumental in bringing the Israelites back to their homeland. It says here in verse 4 that God did this for the sake of Jacob, my servant, Israel, my chosen one. God used Cyrus for Israel's sake. Cyrus was a pagan king. It says here he didn't even know God. Right? 
And here's the thing. The nation of Israel always struggled when God used other nations to accomplish his will. It always tripped them up. It's like, we're chosen, God, so why are you using them? Why are you using them for any reason? We're the chosen ones. Because God can do what he wants to do. He moves on who he wants to move. God is still in the business of being sovereign. Now, it's important to understand that the word anointed in verse 1, in Hebrew, that word is meshach, which is a root word for Messiah. Interesting that he uses the word anointed Messiah for Cyrus. Why? Because Cyrus is a picture of Messiah Jesus who will one day bring the nation of Israel and the Jews back from exile to salvation in him. It's going to happen. It ha- it's happening now. But, but Jesus, when we, those of you who were in the book of Revelation with us, you saw how Jesus was directly interacting with the 144,000. We're going to talk on that in a minute. And so if you go to verse 13 of Isaiah 45, it kind of sums everything up. It says, I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or a reward, says the Lord Almighty. So God clearly says that this Gentile king is the one who's going to do the work to set them free, right? He says he's going he's to rebuild my city. He's going to bring the people back, right? Right? And he says he will not do it for a price or a reward. He's going to do it because it is an instrument of God. He's an instru- he didn't even know God, but he was still an instrument of God. So here's the thing. In Paul's mind, right, Gentiles are the ones who believe in the gospel message of Jesus. And they will be used by God to show Israel who Jesus Messiah is and bring them to salvation. That's what's at work today, church. We are in the time of the Gentiles. But one day that time will end when God takes the church out of this world. And once again, Israel will be the conduit for God's work. Remember, when God anoints and puts a seal on the 144,000 in Revelation, they are 144,000 Jews. They come 12,000 from each tribe, and they are anointed. They come into a God-given relationship through Christ. And they will be the gospel messengers during the tribulation to the nation of Israel. And if we look ahead to Romans chapter 11, 11, and Romans 20, uh, 11, 25, and 26, we see this point I just made to you. I'm going to sum it up for you. Verse 11, 11 says this. Again, I ask, did they stumble so far, or excuse me, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel what? Envious, jealous. They're going to get jealous. Why isn't isn't God using us? Why isn't God speaking through us? Why isn't God doing the things that he promised us? Because you've missed the boat. You've missed the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. You've missed it. And then in verses 25 and 26, it says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in, in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Israel not accepting Christ now is part of a bigger picture, as we saw last week. Israel is like Pharaoh, who is experiencing a hardening of the heart, but it's for God's purpose. During this time, it's the Gentiles, it's the church, who are being used for the gospel. And that will later propel the Jews to respond to the gospel message. Man, God blows my mind. I don't understand all this, but I know one thing's for sure. God is working. God is in the business of salvation. He's in the business of rescue. He's in the business of refreshing and rejuvenating us, man. That's what God does. Verse 22, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the object of his wrath, prepared for destruction? 
What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for his glory? Even us, whom he has also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. And he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. Now, Paul asks a question here. He says, what if God chooses to have patience with objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What does he mean? Listen, the Gentiles were objects of his wrath prepared for destruction because they did not know God. But he was patient. But it's through the Gentiles that were prepared for destruction that his mercy is being shown. To whom? To those he prepared in advance for glory, the Jews. That's what Paul's saying. Remember when Peter was on the rooftop praying? Peter was living in a, in a, a tanner's home. And because a tanner works with dead animals and skins and flesh and all that, Peter couldn't really be in the presence of that. So Peter hung out on the roof a whole lot. Now, while Peter's up on the roof, he has this encounter with God. He has a vision. In this vision, he sees all these unclean things, right? And they're coming down from heaven. And then these these sheets are coming down. Three times he sees this vision. And God says to Peter, dude, rise and eat. Peter says, I can't eat none of that. This stuff's unclean. Finally, God says, listen, nothing is unclean if it comes from me. After Peter comes out of this vision, this trance, a Gentile by the name of Cornelius, he's had this encounter with God, and he sends a couple of his boys over to Peter and says, hey, man, bring this dude back to me because I want to talk to him. Peter's told, hey, there's a couple of guys coming for you. You're supposed to go with them, right? So Peter says, okay, God, I'll go. They show up. He walks over to Cornelius' house, and he gives Cornelius the gospel message. It says that Cornelius and his whole household were saved. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the first Gentiles were brought into the kingdom of God that's recorded in the book of Acts. Now, Peter goes back to his boys, his disciples, and he's going to share with them the good news of what's happened. Here's the problem. Peter coming back and sharing with the disciples that he just had an encounter with the, uh, the Gentiles could be really bad for our boy Peter, right? Right? Because when Peter had showed up to Cornelius' house, the first thing he says to Cornelius is basically, I shouldn't be here because you're a Gentile, but God told me to come. So Peter goes and he shares what happened with Cornelius and what was the response? The other disciples said, praise God, he is now allowing the Gentiles to be part of what he's doing. And because of that, we're here today. We're here today, church. Paul uses this reference in Hosea to bring that point across about the Gentiles. The Gentiles will be called children of the living God. And it's through the Gentiles that Israel will be saved and come back to God. See, Paul's just keeping his pattern going here. He's not talking about a, a, a doctrine to where you were chosen and you weren't chosen. He's trying to establish the fact that the Gentiles are what's being used in this time to bring Israel into the relationship that God has for them. Romans chapter 9, verses 27 through 29. We're almost done. Paul writes, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the Israelites will be like the sand by the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left his descendants, had left his descendants, we would become like Sodom and we would become like Gomorrah. Now, Paul is citing from two passages of scripture here in Isaiah, one out of Isaiah chapter 27. The other one is out of Isaiah chapter 1. And Paul uses these verses out of Isaiah to make his point about ethnic Israel. That not all the children of promise, right, 
are going to... Uh, so all the children of promise are not going to like initially be part of the salvation plan that God has for Israel. In keeping his thought about Cyrus being used to save Israel from exile, Paul thinks of Israel when they were brought back to captivity and exiled by Israel or exiled from Israel by the Assyrians. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Apologize to you guys. Here's what I'm trying to say. When Israel was exiled, right? When the Assyrians came and took them, they killed a whole lot of folks. A whole lot of Jews died and a small remnant went into captivity. It was that remnant that survived that lived to pass on what, who God was to the next generation that was born in captivity. So you have, let's say, all of us, we're, we're now in captivity, and, and, and we're having children, and these children are being born. Well, they're being born first off into a pagan society, something that is totally foreign to the, to the nation of Israel. And now these children, right, they need to be taught who God is. And so they began to be taught this, this Yahweh, this God, this, this amazing God that, that delivered Israel from, from Egypt and so on and so forth. And so... Paul is talking about this remnant that survived, that lived to pass on to God, the, to the next generation. He's saying they, these are the offspring. And unless this remnant had existed during the exile, they'd have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. They'd have been gone, wiped out. The nation of Israel would have been no more. Paul is citing this to make his point that Jews like him, who believe in Jesus as the Messiah, they are the remnant or offspring. It's through Jews like Paul that other Jews and Gentiles will know who Jesus is and come into faith in him. That's his point. He's like, there's a small remnant right now. There's only a few of us. A remnant is just that. It's, it's a small group. But we are committed to Jesus. We're committed to the gospel. And through that, others are going to know who Christ is. Remember what Romans 9, 7 said. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. This remnant of Jews who believe in Jesus are the offspring of the child of promise. They're the offspring of Isaac. And so wrapping up this chapter, starting in verse 30, it says, Paul says, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it? a righteousness that is by faith, but the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Paul says here that the Gentiles have obtained righteousness by faith. It was by faith. But Israel tried to obtain righteousness by works. Wasn't that Luther's point when he broke away from the Catholic Church? Luther's point was this is that it's faith, not works, that earns our way to heaven. It's faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation comes only one way, and it's God's way. It's through faith in Christ, right? This is where, again, the predestination doctrine gets a little bit squirrely because people will say, well, it, salvation is, is all God. You have nothing to do with it. A hundred percent, I got nothing to do with it. I didn't go to the cross and get nailed to the cross. I had nothing to do with salvation, But it's faith that brought me to Christ. The Holy Spirit draws us. There's no way that man comes to Jesus on their own terms. The Holy Spirit totally has to be involved. Why? Because John tells that and tells us in John chapter 15 and 16 that the Holy Spirit's involved. Yes, the Holy Spirit is involved. Yes, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes. But and when our eyes are opened, 
What happens? What do we do with it? Do we accept it? Do we accept the free gift of salvation by faith? Or do we say, I don't need you, God. I don't believe in that nonsense. It's always by faith, church. Even the Torah was about faith. It was about faith. But, but the Jews lost sight of that. They thought it was about keeping the law. But it was really about faith in God who had given them the law as a standard to live by. That's what it was. It was just a standard to live by in contrast to the nations around them. There's nothing in the law that's bad. But we treat it as it's bad. There's nothing in it that's bad. Paul says the law was good. And so the difference is, is that the Gentiles realize that it's righteousness by faith, and Israel missed the mark with that. He then says that a stone has been placed in Zion that causes people to stumble. We know that this stone is Jesus, right? Jesus is always a stumbling block for people. Like, you can walk in here. I can go anywhere and say, man, oh, I just love God. Oh, man. But you mentioned Jesus. People lose their minds. I can talk about Allah. I can talk about Buddha. I can talk about anybody. But if I bring up the J word, whoo, man, people freak out. Jesus is a stumbling block, and he will be a stumbling block. And that's why some people will not inherit eternal life, because they can't get past who Jesus is and the fact that Jesus died for their sins. How can a man going to the cross, how, could that, how can that save me from, from destruction? It does. I don't understand it. I wish I did, but I know that it's the truth. I know that Jesus was a perfect sacrificial lamb. So let's sum up chapter 9. We're at the end of chapter 9. Let's sum it up. In the beginning, to answer the question of why much of Israel or ethnic Jews do not follow Jesus, Paul does three things. Let's highlight them. First, he highlights the ethnic identities of Jews and links those identities with Jesus, who was also a Jew. He also bases a familiar or family relationship, let's say, between God and the Israelites on the promises that God has given to the Jewish people. We saw that in Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. We read that. Secondly, Paul stressed that not everybody in the family of Israel receives the promises of God, at least not initially. Though Abraham had two sons, Isaac, not Ishmael, receives the promise of continuing the nation of Israel. It is Jacob not Esau, who is renamed Israel and becomes the father of the 12 tribes. Similarly, God has set apart a remnant within Israel that follows Jesus now and enjoys the knowledge of Israel's Messiah. And thirdly, Paul says that believing Gentiles received righteousness apart from the law through faith in Jesus. Have we not? But much of Israel did not exhibit such faith. Yet even though Israel has stumbled, we saw that in Romans 9, verses 32 and 33, they have not stumbled so as to fail. That's what we read in Romans 11, 11. Paul alludes to the notion that, current, that the current Jewish remnant of believers, along with Gentiles, will be instrumental in bringing all of Israel to the Messiah. But we're going to have to wait till we get to chapter 11 to get the details and have a full understanding of what Paul is meaning by will all Israel be saved. So that's chapter 9. Go ahead and and read chapter 10. We're going to be in chapter 10 next week. Um, Can't remember what what verses yet, but just read halfway through. That'll that'll probably get you there. And um, so uh, I, I hope today wasn't too confusing for you. I know there was a lot of information here. And again, if you if you don't you know, agree with me, that's okay, right? That's all right. We don't need to divide over something like this. We need to stay united as believers in Christ.